Hello, and welcome to Really with uh, Tom and Dave. And I'm not going to waste any more time, Tom, with frivolities and niceties, because uh, we have an amazing guest today. Yes, I've right. been waiting for this one since we started the podcast. Um, so let's just get right into it. Um, Whitley Strieber is the author of over 40 books, uh, The Wolfen, The Hunger, Superstorm, As the Day After Tomorrow, and Communion have all been made into movies. The Alien Hunter series became the sci-fi channel show Hunters. His website, unknowncountry.com, offers a huge array of stories, podcast interviews, and a large and active social community. His podcast, Dreamland, is in its 25th anniversary year. Uh, Whitley's most recent book is Them, uh, available as a hardcover, softcover, Kindle, and as an audiobook on Audible. So them explores the phenomenon of close encounters with uh, UAP, unidentified aerial phenomenon, commonly known as UFOs. This book is a comprehensive analysis of the experiences of both civilian and military individuals who have had encounters with these phenomenon. Strieber argues that the traditional frameworks of ufology and rejectionism are inadequate for understanding these experiences and proposes a new approach. Um, he also suggests that humanity needs to develop a better understanding of these visitors and find ways to make this relationship work. He argues this is crucial for our survival as our planet's ability to support us declines. And let us please welcome the man himself to really Mr. Strieber. Uh, hello, hello, sir. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. And I, I am also going to be at the Conscious Life Expo at the L.A. Hilton the week of the 10th of February. Oh, so, fantastic. Wow. That's great. Yeah. It'll be in uh, yeah. our neck of the woods here. Yes, I was out in there with my with my friend um, uh, Paul Heineck uh, a couple of years ago. Ah. He was doing some speaking there. I think you probably know Paul. I don't think we've met, but I know, no. of course, of him and his dad. Yeah. 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 I, I, on a personal note, I, um, I approached you at the Saul Foundation, <laughs> sir, um, mm -hmm. just to express, uh, it just feels like this for me, this is a conversation 36 years in the making because communion had such an impact on me. Um, when I read it, I, um, it, it really is, it kickstarted my interest in this topic and this coupled with, um, a very dear friend having an experience really kind of cemented my interest and, and fascination with this topic. And you were so gracious. I was so taken by it because I was a lucid dreamer at the time and I had very intense kind of sleep experiences. Um, nothing, nothing that would necessarily be considered a, an abduction, but I, you were very gracious and returned the letter, my, you know, you know, wrote back to me, uh, which I just thought was fantastic and was very appreciative of. So, uh, after all this time, it's, Wonderful to have you here and have a chance to meet you somewhat in person. Um, but as it relates to letters, so you have them is now um, a collection of letters uh, in some ways. And your analysis of feedback that you've gotten through the years, um, part of this archive that your wife, Anne, had put together. What Tell us about your, your, your feeling like it was time for this book or this, this part of the conversation. Okay, well, the archive is what happened was after we published Communion, a truly enormous number of letters came in. It was just remarkable. Hundreds of thousands, and I'm not just talking about 50 or 100 letters, but absolutely astonishing large numbers of letters. And I um, and read them all and organized them, and they're now at Rice University in an archive called the Archive of the Impossible. And they represent the, I think they were their first contact. I think that's what those letters are. And as much as so many people, the government and whatnot, would not like that to be true, uh, it is true. And um, so uh, uh, what happened over, over the years is we published a book called The Communion Letters a bit after Communion was published. And we uh it was um contained 115 of the letters and and little analyses of them but we really i didn't know as much then as i know now not nearly because i've been doing this now and with the visitors in my life now for most of my life 
and um, I had when I I went when the archive was finished at Rice. I went to look through it just to see the letters all organized and everything. And it was so, such a wonderful experience because they'd been in a storage space in Texas for 25 years. And I thought they'd eventually just be thrown out by someone. You know, I, I didn't know what, no, well, no one cared, but suddenly there, here comes Jeffrey Kripal, the uh, uh, professor of religion at Rice, and he does care. And he arranges this archive. And not only are my letters in it, but the, papers of people like Jacques Vallée and so many others are in it too now. It's a, mm. an extraordinary archive. In any case, um, I was down at Rice and I realized I can think about this better, a lot better than I could then. And mm -hmm. I can really analyze this. I know more about what's going on. I understand this more deeply, much more deeply. And I found that I could apply that to the military situation, too, because I know now a lot about what's happened to the military. I've known many, many people in the military who have told me of their experiences. And now there's uh, material floating around about, uh, about this from the, the uh, Tic Tac and Gimbal videos were public when I wrote the book. This was before David Grush come, came along. Mm. But there was so much more to do, and mm. and I could I could create a, a an impression of them of the visitors that was real, and not a bunch of hooey or uh, you know Space Brothers or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, but I, real I, about I'm this. Yeah, go ahead. I was just, I was just curious, like, what? How was the? Um... I mean, obviously, you're coming to it with a, a lifetime of perspective on the subject, and at this point, was the was the experience of rereading these letters with your new perspective was that a, a qualitatively very different experience from maybe yes. when you read the, the first time around? Oh, absolutely, uh, a very different, and I could see deeply into the letters, and mm -hmm. I could see things like, um, well. Uh, uh, there, and a good example is one a letter called the we call the visitors in the trees because it, it's a letter about a from a, a member of a family who uh, they found these beings all around their house, including in trees, and uh, and uh, it was it, when we first read the letter, it was sort of delightful in a way, and we met the family, Anne and I did, and. Uh, we met some of them, not the whole family. We met the mother and I believe the father and maybe one of the kids. And they were just very straightforward people. There was nothing unusual about them. Uh, they were like the rest of us who were in this experience. We're just people, basically. We're not, uh, we don't sit on any high horses. They seem to have avoided the high horse types pretty pretty carefully, mm -hmm. and uh, which I think makes them mad and is why they're still in a state of denial about it. Because you know they didn't they didn't get tapped uh, mm -hmm. on the shoulder. Anyway, uh, the its experience starts with this strange sort of event where this uh, he, she, it, the daughter notices a woman in a red coat run into their barn. They were li living in a kind of country situation on a side of a hill in a house, and um, and they don't think anything of it. Uh, they go down and look in the barn. There's nobody there. Then a little while later, the woman sees this man, this little man, jump off of their pump house eight feet and go bouncing off in, into the woods. And that's significantly odd. And the thing builds from there. She goes to the store, comes back, and the kids are all in the front yard saying, there are little people up in the trees. And this builds and builds into an incredible experience. And I came to understand that when I first read it, I, I just thought it was a wonderful experience and it was exciting because there were so many people involved. In other words, there was a mm -hmm. witnesses, a lot of witnesses and a two day long experience. That's, that's really memorable. But now I understood it, that these entities 
had carefully, step by step, made sure that this woman would be able to remember what was happening. Because now I understand a lot about the brain and about memory, because as you may imagine, I've studied the brain and I've studied memory assiduously now for years. And I know how the brain processes novel experiences. And, and when I say, I don't mean going on an airplane for the first time, I mean an experience that contains especially forms and sens sensory input that the brain has never experienced before at all. Right. And that is extremely hard to remember correctly because what happens is the brain will find the brain, what the brain primarily does when it's looking at something, when we're perceiving the world, most of what is happening in here is relational. There's a, a huge relational database working all the time to fit things together. Mm -hmm. We don't even think about it. I'm not talking about big impressions. I'm talking about when you look at a TV screen, like we're, or a monitor, like we're looking at now, we know what that is. But what if something was there that you never, that was not in your catalog at all, right? Then you're going to have trouble knowing what's there. And what the being beings were doing was concentrating just on the mother so that she would remember the whole experience from beginning to end. And the experience has a, an incredible trajectory. It starts out with human forms, these two women uh, that are part of it, that are having not, that are not human or they are human, but, and they have these kind of gold, uh, unusual jewelry on. And it ends with them turning into these extraordinary crystalline forms. And what it's telling us is, you don't know what you are guys. Mm. This is a, you know, you're, you're, you're hiding from your truth. And I couldn't have said anything like that when we first published the communion letters, but now I can. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, so the analysis, go ahead, Dave. Oh, no, I was gonna say, yeah, that, that, that there, the experiences aren't just experiences that they're an orchestrated and almost have a syntax. Of their oh, own, they they're, have a, they're communicating something. Exactly. They have a syntax and it's often very subtle mm -hmm. and very complex and very rich. And the, 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 uh, letters, I, I think I go through 11 letters in the book and, uh, explore all of them in terms of that syn type of syntax. All 11 letters are just radically different from one another. Completely. One thing that cannot yeah. be is little men from another world all in the same uniforms and the same belt buckles and everything scientifically, the scientists from another planet. That's not what this is. Or if it is, they sure is very different from us in the way they approach their, their uh, scientific journey. But uh, it was revelatory to go back to the letters. No, they're fascinating. And they are the motives are so inscrutable. And I'm just curious, is that is that a, f a fault of our brains? Or is it a fault of their methodology that these to, to divine what they want seems so if difficult? If you try to if you try if you have an ability to understand equations, and you try, my brother just the other day was trying to say to me, I don't, he said to me, I don't understand how equations relate to the real world. And I thought to myself, how can I ever explain that? <laughs> if, if, you, if you can, can you do it now? Because I've often wondered that myself. Yeah. Well, I don't understand. Know, I that. came up, I thought to myself, what I can do here is I go to the simplest possible is equation. One over two, one half. And I said to him, you, you, that equation, one over two, you tear a piece of paper in half and that's what express, it's expressing. It's expressing halves. And it's expressing something about nature. Every equation is, every, there's no such thing as a, as a 
as a balanced equation that doesn't express something about nature. It's impossible. If it's not balanced, that's probably because it doesn't express something about nature correctly. Mm -hmm. But anyway, look at that in the simplest way. And they have a whole other level of being that they are very familiar with. We have almost lost touch with it in this world. We are so bizarrely confused about it that it's almost impossible to even start. We call it in the West, we call it the soul. It used to be that we had many, many names for the different parts of it. The Egyptians had quite a few, three basic ones, but many, many others. And they they could feel this, this inside themselves. But now when you say the word soul, people immediately think that's not real. I don't have that. That's not part of me. In other words, we're soul blind. And that's the part of us that they're most interested in. Hmm. And it's complicated, it gets complicated too, because it's not all good guys. Uh, there's reasons where you might ex want to exploit that. And uh, that happens to us. Mm -hmm. so, you, you have a very, it is interesting you say that. And the we, we, you talk about they're, they're both hunting us and and they also seem to want us to know it um which seems kind of contradictory in some ways but i i was maybe mistakenly under the impression that you had evolved to a kind of harmonious place dialogue with the visitors in your own life oh very I much could, i could okay so that but but at the same time they're descript you're you do you do overall sort of this is this is a pretty scary uh and you you don't attribute to like a real humanitarian thing here that this this no. seems to be a selfish back and forth or perhaps well, you can I, just I, you're looking at somebody who's had probably experiences as bad as you can have with them. I have had horrible things happen, and with me and my wife, unbelievably terrible things have happened, and they have had a lot of physical reality to them. They're, they're not something anyone dreamed up. This isn't about dreams and senseless uh, imagining at all. It's, it, it has a, it has a, a, a very uh, uh, coherent context to it. And it's not easy. They're not easy to deal with. And they do have uh, ambitions here that I don't think we are comfortable with. I'm not comfortable with, mm -hmm. at least. I mean, to give you an example, they take sexual material from people routinely when they do the abduction. The abductions seem to be kind of over. That was a period from the starting in the 1960s and, and peaking in the 1970s and then trailing off through the 80s and 90s until the early 2000s. It hardly ever happens. Uh, mm -hmm. But... Um, they took a lot of people's sexual material and they took it again and again and again. They took fetuses, they took eggs, they took semen. And in a number of cases, including our case, we had two things happen. One is we had a fetus taken. And two is after my semen was taken 11 years later, they suddenly dumped this little boy in our backyard who was just a, uh, complete basket case. He was a, he was so autistic. He was almost non-functional. We couldn't get near him. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know whether he was a neighborhood child or not, but we'd lost the cabin anyway. And before we could, could get this together, we had to leave. We, we, we were broke. And, uh, that all, that was not also something that was done to us. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't, uh, it was a misfortune, but it was a designed misfortune, not by the visitors, but by people. And um, he followed us to Texas and began uh, living it, 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 in the condo where we were and in, in the same place. And, 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 it, and he was he ended up with these living with these two men in a condo right behind ours. And they, it was not right. Something was very wrong. People began calling social services to try to 
get social services out there to see what is going on. And I uh, called the owner of the condo and he said, there's no one living in my condo. And I said, I'm sorry, there are three people living in your condo. And he had them evicted. And before anything could be done to help this boy, if anything could have been, I suddenly, he burst out of between two buildings and went marching off down the street. And we never saw him again. No one did. Mm -hmm. And the how, two how, men How old was he apparently? 11 or 12. And the two men were in there. Were, oh my God. Were adults. And it was a, it was a mess, but this boy was no ordinary child. He could do things like he could get in your mind. You could feel him in there. And it mm -hmm. was horrendous. Horrendous. So this is too old. This is too young to be some, cause I imagine because I mean, communion was a book and your message and this time, I mean, I know inspires a lot of people, but could also inspire people into, into, you know, wrongful behavior or maybe like they no, get overly this influenced was, this, or this was no ordinary this was not boy. a this was not a sort of stalking I, situation I this think was a, he was my son i think he was taken from i think that semen that was, was taken the, from me and he didn't work out and so they just dumped him in my backyard oh my lord um yeah and, that's you know, this is this isn't going to be easy to deal with there's a reason the government doesn't want to talk about it but at the same time there's another side to it there's another side I could never be as knowledgeable or as richly endowed with spiritual presence as I have become without this experience, without them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think that that helped me at all, but a lot of other things have helped me. And did, have, you, have, did, did you have a religious or a spiritual sort of mindset yeah. before these experiences? Or? I was a, I grew up a Catholic. And um, I'm still not completely, I, I, I have a lot of trouble with the church's handling of those um, pederastic priests and stuff. And I had an uncle who was a, an attorney for the church and ended up having to defend a lot of those men. And he, I got to know a lot about what, they, what ha happened, and that was unspeakably horrible. It was satanic. If I mean, if Satan exists, he he, he invaded yeah. a lot of yeah. priests, and the church mm -hmm. let it happen. So, I'm real careful about mm -hmm. my relationship with the church. But that doesn't. I've written a book called Jesus: A New Vision, which re envisions Jesus. And by the way, if you want to know what what happened to the Roman Empire, you can read that book because I figured it out very clearly and it's explained perfectly in there. It's quite clear. It's never clear, you know, people don't, aren't clear about it, but uh, uh, it, it, w w the teachings of the good side of this other level of reality are really valuable, but you have to go for it. You have to take it. It will not, if you, if you sit back on your ass, this is going to do all kinds of awful things to you. And it's going to eat you alive. But if you take control of it and you, you are humble enough to pray, you're humble enough to live a really examined life and to help others whenever possible, it changes. Yeah, it, changes. It, it feels like there's a definite parallel between your experience and knowledge of the, of the Catholic Church and your experience of the visitors. Well, the thing is that it, it, it's the teaching of Jesus more than anything. I don't think it's mm -hmm. so much the Catholic Church, but that teaching has been so debased. I mean, you, there are people who justify all kinds of racism and, and uh, uh, wealth gathering and things based on distortions of, of, of those simple teachings. But those teachings are much deeper, much more powerful than we give them credit for. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, without, I'm not, I'm not in any way involved in any Christian organization, any evangelical thing or Catholicism or anything like that. But I am very much a student of those teachings. 
And mm-hmm. I, I try to live them seriously, try to live them every second of my life. Mm-hmm. Do you, is there a way, uh, let me see how I can phrase this. In terms of an experiencer, you, you, you received hundreds of thousands of letters, as you stated, when, when communion yeah. came out, that, that there was such a response, which speaks to an unspoken need for that to, to yeah. be spoken. That, a, a reality. Uh, we, mm-hmm. Yeah, we think of, you know, John Mack and, and how he, you know, re, he concluded that there were so many more of these cases than we could fathom. He believed it was, uh, it was common even. Um, is there anything from your experience, for example, as I understand it and remember it, you did not initially see beings. You, your, your very first experience, as I understood it, was it was just lights uh, or, or something that you needed to then further explore. I could be wrong, but yeah, I just... that's not quite right. But let me... Yes. What happened was this. Um, I apparently had this experience when I was a child, but I'd forgotten about it completely. I see. Um, which now that I know how the brain handles novel uh, impressions like that, I understand why. But it, but uh, so uh, so there was no, you know, eventually they quit coming and there, there was no follow up, and I, it just just disappeared into my memory, beyond my memory, until I accidentally remembered it again uh, uh, when I was consulting with Dr. Donald Klein, the forensic, uh, the psychiatrist who gave me hypnosis. Uh, in any case, the, the, uh, the experiences you, you have to, you have to be very proactive if you're going to make this work. If you're passive, it's going to eat you up. And all of these people, most of them, I think, do it well. And that's the thing that's so surprising when you read the letters. It's not a litany of one horror show after another. I'm one of the most beat up ones that, that there is. And I thought, you know, Annie and I would read the letters and she'd say, why do you get beat up? And the others don't. I said, I think because they're experimenting on me to see just how much we can take. Mm-hmm. And because it was, I mean, when I say beat up, I mean beat up. I mean, I was uh, traumatized, extremely traumatized, and so was she. But other people, when you read the letters, have very different experiences. They have experiences so illuminating that it, I wouldn't say it's too small a thing to say it changes their lives. It changes their being. You know, it's like an ant dancing with an elephant. They might love each other very much, but they'd both be da- better be damn careful if they're going to keep dancing together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they are such, they're such different experiences. And I was wondering as part of that, uh, uh, is it with whether there are markers for people who may not have had such kind of extreme, like the Grand Central Parkway one where these two people, witnesses saw something extraordinary on the side of the road, you know, this ship flew over head, but... Uh, I was wondering if there are smaller signs that someone might have be an experiencer that they don't know it, or is it something that they it shouldn't? Do you recommend they pursue that, or do you recommend that if it hasn't really come to them, let it let it be? Well, look, I I have to tell you that I don't know how to answer that because I don't know how to pursue it. Uh, the problem with hypnosis is that. If you want something to be true and you will make it true and you will make your memory, you will, Mm -hmm. you will build false memories very easily. Now it takes a Dr. Klein was not just a hypnotist. He was a psychiatrist and a leading psychiatrist is the head of the New York state department of psychiatry. Not only that, he was a specialist in forensic hypnosis mm. and had at that point in his career solved 72 criminal cases using it by, by enabling people to remember things like license numbers. Now that's proof positive that he knew what he was doing when it, but most people, when they, the first thing they do is they'll go to some, well, a UFO, someone who's in the UFO movement who, who does hypnosis. And they're in already telling themselves, I want to hmm. find out that I was abducted. And they're going to. They're going to build a, 
a story and maybe it's a true story, but the problem is you can't know. Mm -hmm. You can't know whether or not it's true. It's like uh, remote viewing. I get all these things that are the remote viewing the visitors in this. And that's wonderful. I'm, maybe it's true, but there's no, there's no baseline of fact. And in my case, there was, in, uh, uh, because we had, and it turned out uh, that there was another man who saw it happen, saw it happen to me. And he's not in any of the books because he came along too late. Uh, I think I might have mentioned him in uh, A New World, but about a year after the communion experience, he came up to the door. He was a neighbor, and he and his wife had been driving home the night that it happened, about 2 o'clock in the morning, and they saw what they thought was the Goodyear blimp in, in a field near our houses. And he thought, they thought, my God, it, that shouldn't be there. It's, it's, we better stop and see if we can help them. So he got out of the car and climbed the fence and was walking toward it. And he heard screaming inside of it. And he started running toward it because he thought there were people hurt in there. Whereupon it turned on all these lights and made a growling noise and started coming toward him. And his wife, uh, of course, freaked out because she was seeing this. And he said, it scared me too. And he turned around and got over the fence again and got in the car and drove off. And he said to me, Whitley, I'm just so ashamed. I've read this book now. And um, I, uh, I'm ashamed to say that I didn't help you and I probably could have. And I said, no, you couldn't. Wow, You're, yeah. This is the smartest thing you ever did was get a hell out of that field. And I'm glad you did because I don't know if you'd be here if you hadn't. That's so, remarkable. That's wow. remarkable. So someone was there. You yeah. Know, yeah. Then it's I get this implant in my ear and all this stuff. There's plenty of physical proof that it really happened. Sure. Yeah. Plus people came to the cabin and they would come, the visitors would come and meet people at the cabin. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah, so. I guess that's important to point out though for people that, because you talk about this, these experiences as being a form of communication, but they are f solidly physical experiences. Well, sometimes they are, and not always. In fact, even not usually. But the important thing is this. We've had a sea change. Before David Grush came out, I had heard about bodies. General Arthur Exon told me, uh, no, I correct that. He told me about the materials. He told another relative about the bodies, uh, which he had seen. At, uh, uh, I, I, we, it, did I bring him up in this before? I don't think so. Okay, well... General Exxon and one of my uncles were at the Air Material Command, attached to Air Material Command at Wright Field in 1947 when the Roswell materials were brought in. And uh, uh, I found out after I published Communion, they basically said to me, you know, we've got something we'd like to talk to you about. And they spilled the beans about this. And I based my book Majestic in part on what they said, my novel about the Roswell incident. It's a novel largely because, uh, you know, I had no documentation. In any case, uh, they, they, um, General Exxon told me that there had been bodies, and he, told, not me, told my relative, and he said it was, he had held one, and it was like a big insect, was what he said. And um, then David Grush comes along, and he says that there are biologicals, that we have biologicals. And that's a sea change because prior to this, of the David Grush confirmation and uh, uh, General Twining also told his son that he'd seen bodies. Uh, but so there are physical beings involved in this and they are there. There's ultimately the, and, but here's the question, is there fundamental reality, the physical world like ours, if ours indeed is, or is this something they kind of dip into like a scuba diver going underwater? Mm -hmm. I, yes, I think that's been, that was one of the very kind of interesting aspects of the, of like the soul foundation discussions. I was curious what your impressions were of that, because it feels like there's this 
there has been this um, increasing comfort with discussing the UAP phenomenon as it has been kind of adjusted to talk about aer aerospace safety and we're going to call them UAPs now and not you and we're going to remove some of the stigma and we're going to do but I'm I'm how do you feel the experiencer movement or the ex just that phenomenon is fitting into this new dialogue and are you satisfied with well, where where it is I I think I'm satisfied with where it is yeah I'll say that to begin okay. um I, it I was not allowed to sp ask to speak at the Soul Foundation and so I asked questions instead to to make the presence of the experiencers known and i know gary nolan pretty well we're we're friends i consider him a friend a good friend in fact and um we talked about it and he said the problem is that there were a lot of people at that conference who simply wouldn't be comfortable listening to the an experiencer talk because they are not ready to deal with the idea that there might be somebody coming out of these things. And I you know, understand that. And we have to take it step by step. The next conference is going to be in Washington. And once again, I don't think experiencers will be involved. And if experiencers are involved, I'm thinking that it might be someone soft first, because there are people with softer experiences than I've had. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm the kind of guy who, you know, I'm like a roach. I mean, you pound him into the ground and the next thing you know, here he comes out again from behind the couch. And that's swimming sort of, in the deep end of the pool. You're uh, right, yeah. exactly. That's, that's me. I mean, I'm yeah. the kind of guy that they can be confident that they can beat the shit out of, and I'm not going anywhere basically. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but I, that's not true of most people that run like hell. Yeah, I mean, I can understand that this is the pragmatic concern of, well, how do we broaden the number of people who are paying attention at all to the phenomena? Well, I, um, I'm very torn about that. I, I think that I think that if we if we sugarcoat it a bit and let the the people who've had or have memories of good experiences start the the dialogue, it might work better. But I think it might be a mistake because it seems to me that we need to face the we need to face this thing, and if if it, 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 it maybe it would be okay to edge into it, but uh, rather than the experience or narrative starting the the a relationship between our intellectual community and scientific community and academic community and this experience it would be better if there could be some substantive uh something more substantive and it's possible to create that uh using an fmri machine that's a functional mri scanner which which well does mri scans while the person is using their body or brain you can determine how the brain is assembling memories when you are the person is in, in the fmri is asked to remember things and the brain stores memories of physical events differently from its from its the way it stores dreams and imaginary things and confabulations even though those confabulations may be believed by the person as mm -hmm. true you get someone like me in a scanner like that, and you ask them careful questions. You, it would take a while to get the questions put together correctly, and probably a number of sessions to do it. And you, but you will eventually get up to the point where you have a picture of what the brain thought was physical, experienced mm -hmm. as physical that came in through the eyes, the ears, the nose, the sense of touch, and so forth, and what the brain put together on its own. And mm -hmm. I think that's the kind of place to start. And Gary, that's fascinating. Gary yeah. Nolan is sort of doing things in that area. Is he is, and uh, he's. I, I've talked to him about this, of course, and mm -hmm. he agrees that it's something that we should do, but um i think i'm gonna be the one that has to raise the figure out how to get the money and i'm gonna go to him and say look gary 
we've got a million dollars to do this, so let's do it. Yeah. And if you don't have time, give me a good uh, neuro, neurology, neurological biologist who does. Yeah. And, and I well, I know he's done a lot of looking at the, the caudate putamen and how yes, it's, he has. how its relative development seems to correlate to people who have um, paranormal experiences or people who are more likely to see things out of the ordinary. Did, did, That's has, right. Has Gary checked out your 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 uh, my Cadre brain was Damon. checked out by uh, Kit Green, who works with yeah. Gary, yeah. and um, Kit said, that, "Well, th th let's be let's excuse me, let's go, let's get." Let me fill in a little bit. Yes. The area between the caudate and the putamen is part of the executive functioning of the brain. That, that is to say, the part of the brain that's organizing experiences. And this, uh, there's white matter. There are cells journey uh, between the, the two areas, and they communicate between the two areas. And the denser that is, the richer the communication, and the more... Uh, complex the person's perceptual system is and most people have a more than adequate it's a really good system i mean built up in us and uh we're ours are much denser than the the, the ones of a say a gorilla but uh some people have an even denser system and th th those people begin to perceive things that the rest of us don't and that they and they, they these are the psychics and the the people who have uh, coherent memories of close encounter experiences and things like that, because these things are apparently happening at a some kind of a uh, a level that uh, doesn't um, the, the the brain doesn't usually draw impressions from. I I, I think that's a good way of putting it. My case is slightly different. I have a higher than normal uh, uh, density, but not as high as the densities of some of the experiencers that they've studied. Uh, but the thing that was so surprising about it to Kit was that it was unique. The, the structures don't look like normal brain structures at all. And there are there are connections between the two, the caudate and the putamen, that are unique in his experience. And he's studied an awful lot of brains in his life. So I was left thinking to myself, um, hmm, <laughs> what does this mean? Yeah. I'll tell you one thing it does mean is this. Uh, I cannot go near hallucinogenic substances. I have had one experience in my life of being in a room where there were people smoking marijuana. And, you know, I mean, that's not a big deal. It's not considered a major hallucinogen by any means. But what happened to me was that I was in there for about five minutes talking. I couldn't stay in because the smoke was too thick. And um, I, this was back in the 70s. And in New, we were living in New York at the time. And all the next week, I kept, when I was walking back and forth to the office, I kept seeing myself pass me in, in the street for, and for the whole week. And Annie said, it's that grass that you were in that room. You should never go near it because uh, you, uh, uh, you're obviously very sensitive to it. So the next weekend, we went to another party. It's a much more staid party and a beautiful uh condominium on West End Avenue in Manhattan. And I effusively complimented the hostess on the goldfish in her lampstands. She had these big glass lampstands and, and says to me, we're going home. You're still high. There are no goldfish in those lampstands, Whitley. And I could wow. still see him even when she said there were none there. I was <laughs> tempted to ask the woman if Anne was pulling my leg, but then I looked again and they weren't there anymore. And so we wow. went home. So Goodness. obviously, as Annie put it, at least we don't have to worry about paying for any hallucinogenic drugs. Yeah, you yeah we're going to hear one in your head. Where we're going to take head. you off the DMT <laughs> list, I think, for now. Yeah, I don't here's think... the thing. 
is it something in here that's triggering these super dense hallucinations so intense that they can actually cause physical injury because my rectum was injured. I, I struggled with the pain from that for 20 years. I was under medical, uh, I, I had medical, had to have medical care for it for 20 years. Mm-hmm. So it was not, it was not, not real. It was damn yeah. real. And yeah. this thing is certainly real. And is it still in the, the implant yeah, is still in right here. here? Yeah. Right here. I feel it right now. Yeah. And, um, it's active. I mean, it, it turns on all the time and what's I the, use it all the time. I use it the, in my research. What's, what's the sensation of it turning on? Gets hot. Ear gets yeah. hot. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah. So you, you had said something about earlier about that, that the abduction cases were tapering out in the thousand, you know, in the, uh, yeah, yeah. the aughts I'd say. And I, and that mm-hmm. reminded me that you, you had this, you had this, um, in the book, you talk about three phases of contact, and yes. uh, can you can you describe what you what you mean or what the theory is behind that? Well, I think that the easiest way always to think about a thing like that is to turn it around and say, "Okay, we're the aliens. We find a planet where these poor duffers have never left their planet. They don't know a darn thing about the rest of us in the universe." What are we going to do? And the answer is we're going to do a lot of things. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to prescribe any direct contact with them because we're going to want to do two things. First, we're going to want to identify and understand their cultures in situ. In other words, without them knowing about us because they, we would understand that their awareness of us would change their cultures completely. Uh, number two, we are going to want to understand them. And that starts with their biology. And that would mean we would be sampling them. And if we thought that there was a chance that they were going to go extinct, and we may have seen this happen to other species, intelligent species. In fact, it might be a very common fate for intelligent species. We might think, well, we're going to, as a side project, we're going to build a genetic image of them and the other creatures on their planet so that we can reconstruct it somewhere else if we have to. And what am I telling you about? I'm telling you about how the visitors relate to us right now. All of those things are being done. Mm-hmm. So now that we know that they are physical entities, maybe we are dealing with people from another planet. Mm-hmm. In which and, case, I only want to know one thing. How the hell did they get here? Mm-hmm. I know. Me too. Um, and and you think there's an uptick in in that activity now? Is it? Do you feel like it's a it's an awareness growing, and that we have more means of recording sightings, or do you our, feel our like awareness it's a, is is growing now? But they are not. And I think part of the reason our awareness is growing is that they no longer need us to not know about them. They've done the, 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 the genetic, all of the genetic uh, sampling that they want to do. And, you know, they couldn't do that. If, they, if we'd known about them, people would have been, there would have been a terrific kerfluffle here about, you know, what the hell? I'm not having aliens coming in my <laughs> house and taking, my, taking, taking stuff out of my body. You know, yeah. I've got my yeah. guns. We're going to have a 24-hour <laughs> guard. And you know, et cetera, people would not have tolerated that. It had to be, it had to be secret then. And you know, there's some kind of connection between the visitors and the government, but uh, because the the secrecy was kept, even though I think they knew what was happening. And the reason I think that is, uh, David C. Webb, who was a a uh, ne- NASA guy and uh, 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 very involved in intelligence work. He, he, con- uh, sp- he consulted in, uh, in, on space matters with every alphabet agency there was. And where did he show up? At our cabin, he ended up coming, to, he ended up coming into our lives somehow or another in 1986. 
and used to come up to the cabin and spend time with us and uh, have dinner with us in the city. And there was no question. He knew this was going on. That mm -hmm. he, didn't, he didn't question for a minute. And he was so encouraging to me. He said, Whitley, keep going out there. Keep doing it. And he implied one time that there wasn't anyone else in the world who had ever gotten as close to them as I have. And he, I, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but, but the point is this. Back in 1986, the government knew damn well this was going on or he wouldn't have been there. And therefore, they must have known before that. Therefore, there was never anything they could do about it. And that would probably explain a good deal of the reticence and the secrecy. Yes. Do you, do you think that was, that, yeah. do you think that was a, a professional approach to sort of just get to know you and study what was going on and just to get a better yeah. sense? Or do you of think that it was, was? It okay. wasn't social. I mean, we didn't have any social connection to him whatsoever. Uh, I've, I have forgotten quite how he, oh, and he gave us, gave me an allergist who gave me allergy shots to take for two years that suppressed the effects of being touched by the visitors. And they gave us epinephrine injectors to fill a hole, put in the whole cabin in case they affected people who came there. And that, that happened. Raven Dana had a major allergic attack when, after one of them touched her. And, you know, they knew they had to have known. Mm -hmm. And he and was, ex back he to was see explicit about it. After a couple of years to thank him and went into the office and the office he'd given me as his office. I'd never actually seen him. They sent me the pill, the, the, the uh, uh, serum. And he came to the apartment in Manhattan to show me how to put it in. They'd never heard of him at the office. Came, oh, wow. It was a doctor's office. They had no idea who he was. Very suspicious. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Well, of that's... course it is. I mean, yeah. somebody somebody knew somebody who was keeping a secret knew knew some things. Mm -hmm. But here's a great question. Why the United States? Why is it so prevalent here and not elsewhere in the world? And I think I've got some answers to that question. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things is that if you get a large group of close encounter witnesses together who are real ones and not people who've gone, you know, paranoid schizophrenics and stuff who get into this in the ass backwards way. Uh, uh, you find a very gentle group of people, most of them pretty smart people, n not heavily, not PhDs and stuff, but people who are s just smart, some of them with college degrees, some of them without, but, and they're gentle. They're very gentle and they're very social. They kind of stick together. When you get a big group of them together, no one wants to leave. It's, I've done this many times and you know, and you think Annie used to say, you know, they're so sweet. And I thought to myself, these visitors are little bitty people. Of course they got the gentlest people they could find to do this mm -hmm. with. Because they, you know, they didn't want, they didn't want uh, people to tear their UFOs apart or something. Yeah, uh, they haven't I mean, abducted were... the rock. You're, what? Yeah. They haven't abducted the rock. No, I don't think yeah. that one, that was the plan. But yeah. you, you, you see that, and then there's another thing that DNA trauma is projected down generations by DNA. And in the United States, there are lots of people and families who have never had the experience of violence and warfare. So it's a very large pool of DNA that is not affected by violence. And, you know, and I think that's who they, they got. I think mm -hmm. that's, who they, that's why they're here, primarily here. And another thing I know about them, they love freedom. They're very, very aware of free will mm -hmm. and they are not going to interrupt free will uh, if, in, unless they have to. And, and that would be a reason that they were so secretive about what they were doing. They didn't want to, they didn't want to put us in a position where we're to totally turned toward them and only interested in them. 
They didn't want to colonize us culturally. They wanted us to be free. Does that imply that they have a, a, a sense of free will in their own in, in their own existence, or is it or would is free it's will not something an they're interested question. by? My answer is I. It, they're too complicated. Yeah. Some of them, I can't believe they could have free will, but I could be wrong. Yeah, are, are they maybe intrigued by our free will because it's novel to them? I think that's quite possible. Yeah. Um, and yet the one on the cover of Communion, the old lady, as Anne used to call her, um, was an independent being. I feel like maybe there's a hierarchy of complexity that there are fully functional beings at kind of the top of their food chain and then they have lesser lesser uh, uh, versions of their own species it, you know it, 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 not slaves so much as roboticized versions of themselves you know in a conversation we had with Avi Loeb he brought up the idea that um, perhaps there was an maybe an uptick in activity was due to an AI visitor being fascinated by a sort of the the kind of fetal AI that's just burgeoning now. I just I don't know what what do you think of well, that? That's I what John was... von Neumann thought. Uh, John von Neumann, uh, he was one of the scientists who first worked on this, and he was a cyberneticist and one of the one of the early pioneers of uh, quantum physics, and he conceived of the idea of an idea that he called the von Neumann machine, which used to be plain as day on the internet, but it's now a little harder to find. But um, th this was a, a machine that was, would be a complete replica of a species of all of their knowledge, all of their being replicated in a machine that was then sent out into a galaxy to find places where it could reproduce that species. And he even figured out how long it would take it to circumnavigate the galaxy and it's all kinds of stuff. And what if that's true? And it came here and found that this place was a place that would be congenial to the species and that it could enact that, it could enact its program here but it had not been programmed to account for another species already being present on the planet. And it is here trying to figure out what to do. How, how, to, how to cohabitate with us? <laughs> well, exactly. And that would maybe explain the little boy in the backyard because, you know, you've got a, a conscious machine possessed of general intelligence on a high level, but it's yeah. not the spark is missing. Mm -hmm. Something's uh, missing. It's not um, quite them. Yeah. There's, I, I, I was going to say, I think there's a, it, that calling you an experiencer is an inadequate term because it seems like you're not just having experiences. It seems like you've had this almost lifelong relationship. Yeah. With these beings. I have. Um, and, and how in the world did that happen to me? I just don't know. Yeah. And, but do you feel like, are they still at this point uh, in this relationship you're in? Oh, yeah. Are, are they with, but are they withholding things from you deliberately? Are they, are they, I mean, they're, it doesn't feel like they're, and all the time you've had these experience, this interaction with them, this relationship with them, um, they are, conti they continue to be obscuring. They are very good. Yeah, giving me just enough information to where if I try, I can put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, and nothing more than that. And they do keep their own counsel for sure. Yeah. Um, do you think that's uh, like, you know, you can't give a, a plant uh, the and a year's worth of water. You'll kill it. I guess that's a good thought. Yeah. And that, that, that means that despite the incredibly annoying way, the, how annoying this is, I might as well accept it. Mm -hmm. But they're, you know, they're working with me now on a new book and uh, it's very indirect and very subtle, but it's mm -hmm. there. And I, 
I notice it as best I can. I wish I could say I noticed all that they give me, but I don't. I notice as much as I can. Well, I, I know we're running out of time, but can you describe just a little bit how that in, how that collaboration works? Just, I mean, I, I know we're sure. It, I think it uses the implant. Yeah, and um, I've already had the. This is a long story. I, I had the implant explained to me by a couple of guys who showed up here. Kit was interested in the implant, and he wanted to. He he, he wanted a, 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 a CT scan of it. And um, I think they were afraid that he would go from there to trying to convince me to get it taken out. I already had that. I did that. I tried that in 1994. It was put in my ear in 1989 at the old cabin. And um, by two people, not by aliens. Mm -hmm. Although I can't say there wasn't anything else in the room. And um, in May of 1989, and... There was a big operation going because there were, we heard the crunching of gravel in the driveway. It was a shale driveway and no lights. And so I was getting ready to go for my guns when these people came in and kind of overpowered me. And uh, the next thing I knew, the next morning, my, they, they pushed me into the bed and I couldn't move or see anything. And this thing was in my ear and it, there was no scar. In other words, they, it was not a surgery. They, it somehow got in through the skin. Mm -hmm. And now there's a big kerfluffle. Of course, I was very upset and uh, trying to figure out why the alarm hadn't gone off and everything and got the alarm guy over and weird stuff was discovered. Uh, strange, high powered magnetic fields that shouldn't have been there and things. So um, then in 1994, I tried to get it taken out. And uh, when the doctor touched it with it opened it up and touched it with the edge of a scalpel it went down into my earlobe on its own and he pulled out because you know he was knew he was taking a cyst out of the ear of whitley streber and he was aware of communion but <laughs> then he when that happened he fig figured hell i'm dealing with an alien implant here i'm not <laughs> that's not my job Wow. And it's able to just travel through flesh like that. It's right. And it's wild. all on video. It's, the video wow. is on my website. So, you know, and took a, we took a video and took a video of it while of the of the operation. And so you can see her and and, and the nurse and, and him looking at it and describing it as a white disc. They could see it in there. Mm -hmm. So, OK, that's there. Now, years and years and years pass. I don't. It comes back up about three days later. It comes back up to here. Um, and years and years and years pass. Anne's passed away. And as soon as Anne passes away, a, 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 a kind of lens opens up in this eye. A, 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 a oblong square opens a slit. And I begin to see words in it going through very quickly like somebody typing at high speed with an old-fashioned typewriter. And, I, you know, I'm thinking, what the hell is this now? And the thing's turning on all the time. And then when I decided to I get it CT scanned, these two, there came a knock at the door at 4 o'clock in the morning. It's a certain type of knock that I'm not going to repeat here. But it, it tells me that they are, it's them. And I've opened the door to them. I opened the door in any way. Anyway. And these two guys come in. One of them was vaguely familiar to me, strangely enough, although I can't say quite why. Uh, and they say they want to explain it, the implant to me and why I shouldn't have it taken out. And I said I wasn't thinking of getting it taken out, but... Or I didn't say that. I was going to say that, but I thought, no, I'm not going to say that. I want to hear what they have to say. So we talked, and uh, they were obviously very cognizant about the implant. And they said it had been invented by a man named Constantin Rodave, and that it, the slit, what that was doing was drawing remembered information that was in my unconscious mind up toward my conscious mind so that I could use it as a source of inspiration. And that they said it also will 
just if you ask it questions, it's going to answer those questions in a number of ways that will seem to you like chance, but they're not chance. And you will find it's very consistent. And that's how it works. It works those two ways. And it works very, very well. And it's a human construction, the technology. Well, here's the thing. Constantine Rodave was an expert in electro electronic voice uh, where you where you t take a tape recorder and and you you hear people talking on it and they say that's the voices of the dead uh -huh. and he was a master that was his profession in, the, in his mastery in life but he's been dead since the 1970s so if it was him who invented it apparently invented it from the other side wow <laughs> and and that gets into the depths of this thing because we're not yeah. Not only are we not alone here, our dead play a big role in all of this. Uh, well, this more than feels like a to be continued. I mean, this is <laughs> we dip, we've just barely yeah. dipped our toe, but we. Um, yeah, that that relationship to the dead would certainly be something we'd love to talk about. Yeah, That's a we new level, but it's very important. And yeah. you know, to all anyone who's listening to this, don't don't push this aside because it's not what you expect it to be. If we, if what was happening with the visitors was what we expected, then it would be fake, but it's mm -hmm. not fake. Mm -hmm. I am a truth teller 